The gentleman that I'm about to introduce, Paul Shariari, who I have only met over the phone, but I found I had an amazing conversation with, with, with him when I did, is Senior Vice President of Strategic Sustainability and Smart BIM. He is an authority on green building, the application of technology in the building process, and has founded two companies. He is an expert and loves to discuss trends in sustainability and how technology will affect their customers. Please help me welcome Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Can everyone hear me all right? Great. I'm really thankful for being invited to come talk to you guys. I, I feel very humbled by the folks that have uh, preceded me, and I hope I can keep your interest after lunch. Um, some of the things I'd like to explore as I have this talk with you guys and talk to you over the next couple of days is I'm really passionate about making sure sustainability actually sustains itself as a movement. I've been doing this for 15 years. I've been a consultant. I've built technology mostly because I'm a lazy engineer and I hate doing things over and over again. Uh, but I really worry that we have made it really, really hard for other people to kind of come into our choir. We've made it complex. We've made a lot of, I think, some, some tactical errors along the way. And I hope that we do this right because I have two daughters now. When I started this, I, didn't, I wasn't even married, but I have a 10-year-old and a 12-year-old. And I hope that we can at least sustain this until their generation comes on board because I think their collaborative nature is going to be really, really good. I think we need to add more fun into sustainability. I think a lot of it is doom and gloom. A lot of it is, oh my gosh, these problems are really big. And the, and the reality is, is they are very big. You know, can you imagine any Amtrak bus or train pulling up at a station seven feet short and having people push it in? What would have happened is like 5,200 people would have sued Amtrak for, for being late to work and someone would have slipped and fall off the tracks and all that other kind of stuff. So I think a, a, a country that will do that and get on a bus to go somewhere or go to work, that's, that's real resil resilience. And, I, and I've been following this trend of like economy versus the green economy, tech versus green tech, entrepreneurs and what I've been called as a greenpreneur. I'm a serial ADD engineer. I can't stop solving problems. What I, what I luckily get to do is go through lots and lots of problems and try to come up with unique ways to solve them. So we always talk about data. Everyone always asks me, well, where's all the data from the software that you've built or the software that you, you want to build? And I think data is, is good. I think some of it drives our decisions. I think it doesn't always help you actually decide, though. A couple of people have talked about the emotional reasons for doing things. I think it's really, really important. As soon as we saw that Ferrari, it wasn't the technical camshaft, horsepower, gearing ratio that makes you want to get excited. It's just that car looks like it was going fast. And I think we have to get back to that because I think we've overloaded our ideas with this need for data. And now the cloud can hold all your data. And you can get your data anywhere. You know, I personally love going places where my cell phone doesn't work. I can't get a data plan and I can actually unplug, which is actually getting harder and harder and harder to do. Just got back from a vacation with my children and they're happy that the satellite system on the cruise ship went down because daddy didn't have to check on emails or anything like that at the end of the day. But I found an internet cafe on, on the Mexican beach, which was really sad for me, but I had to check in. When I started out with LEED, there was one rating system. It was Pilot. I was one of the first 100 people that got LEED accredited. I was one of the first faculty members of the USGBC. Spent five years of my life traveling around the world, sitting in rooms like this, talking to 25,000 adults for seven hours at a time to get LEED accredited. And almost every time I did it, the adults were just like drained. They didn't want to go there. You'd start, how many people were made to go here by your firm or your boss? And almost everyone's hands went up. One time I did it at a, at a really awesome resort in Hilton Head, and then this big, gigantic thing, and one of the women got up. She was an architect. She just pressed this button and like, and we looked out over the practice putting green. It was the most amazing backdrop. And I was like, you know what? There's 600 of you in here. I hope you guys get something out of what's behind me. Hopefully the screen is important, but what's behind you is even more important. This complexity has created green fatigue. 500 or so green eco labels, rating systems, product data coming out. When I built one of my first software tools, Eco Scorecard, we had 12 characteristics of a product that I had to track to do lead evaluations. Our Eco Scorecard system now has 1,200. I'm about to expand it to about 6,200 working with Terry from Sustainable Minds just to bring in the LCA type of data sets. I don't want to see that information. I've never presented the lead certification manual to any client in my history and then ever jump up and do that whole jump. Oh my gosh, more data, I can make decisions. So I think 
sustainability teeter-totters on the eye, and that's information. I think on the left-hand side, we have thousands of data points. Whenever I've sold sustainability to a client, I've needed less than three data points on the right-hand side. So if you've ever seen kids on a playground on a seesaw, regardless of how big both kids are, they all get to go play. And I think we're realizing, and I'm certainly realizing, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, is that if you give people less than three reasons why to do sustainability, and they're good ones, and they're the ones you would believe in, i.e. walk the walk, you'll do it. You'll absolutely do it, because it, it resonates emotionally. And there's a lot of different triggers to emotion, but I'm going to talk about two that I used uh, successfully. I got asked to talk about multiplayer games, and I love playing games. When I first started playing games, it was Atari or Intellivision or Nintendo, and it was usually two people attached to a computer playing a game. And I loved it. My daughters now play with games where 1,200, 1,500 kids from around the world are all playing on a server, all interacting, all collaborating. And one of the things I've been doing over the last year is thinking about how I can make my life more fun. I build engineering software, but I want to actually figure out something else to do when I grow up, which is make games for kids so they learn about sustainability. So I've done this research. Three billion hours a week are spent playing online games, not by kids, by all people. Kids play 10,000 hours of games by the time they reach 21. They also spend about 10,000 hours in school from fifth grade till graduation from high school. 500 million global gamers. The software I've built has made a lot of lead accredited professionals' lives easier. Helps solve a lot of cost-benefit analysis for lead projects to get them over the cost barrier. But you know what? I've never had 500 million people think about sustainability. That's my goal in life. I want to get to those and hopefully in the next decade get to a billion people. Because you know what? All of us that live on this planet better start playing the game of sustainability. Not in the engineering sense, but actually help people understand the engineering ramifications of what we do. Because as an engineer, I know that I'm incessantly boring. You can ask my wife. She's over there by the pool, hanging out, enjoying her day. And when I get into this whole idea of let me tell you why sustainability is important, which I spent the first 10 years of my life doing, not too many of my normal friends, as we call them, care. And we got to fix that. So Minecraft's a game that my daughters love to play. I didn't know what they were asking to buy. It's a European game. They bought it. And it's a game about breaking and placing blocks. I'm reading this before I spend my $29 online. I'm like, what the hell is this? And at first, people built structures to protect against nocturnal monsters. But as the game grew, people worked together to create wonderful imaginative things. This is what you get when you go to their main website before you pay the $29. I'm like, let me look at this. It is the worst graphical representation. It's 8-bit graphics. But you know what? Look at what people are building. Not by themselves. Collaboratively. People recreate the entire Gangnam Style video in Minecraft. They've rebuilt the entire movie Jurassic Park. My daughters play with about 1,500 different friends around the world every single week for about four hours. And my daughters aren't architects, engineers, or contractors, but you know what? They learn how to collaborate better than the $30 billion worth of construction I've worked on as a consultant, ever. Can you imagine getting 1,500 people on an IPD project around the world to build that city? It wouldn't happen. And yet we need it to happen to save this planet. SimCity is just coming out. I don't know if you've noticed the, the ads on TV. I played it as a kid with really bad interaction, but the gameplay is really good. Fast Company got a bunch of urban planners, some of the best in the world, to compete in SimCity to see if sustainability in their heads could work. And the result was it didn't work. All the typical emotional needs of people to grow their economy, do all these stupid things, Sewer plants are downstream of the, are upstream of the city. People planted a couple windmills in the middle of downtown and realized it was killing birds and they had to figure that out again. And the, and the ironic thing is that it didn't actually work. I got to work on a project of similar nature that also didn't really work. Expats flying in by the millions, building out 12 million dwelling units for the native 2 million person population. And I got asked by a large manufacturer in the U.S. because I built some cost-benefit software in the eco scorecards. I said, come over for 10 days to Dubai and help us figure out how to get the spec on the very crown of the Palm Jumeirah. That last three little fronds is owned by the royal family. And they're going to be given away 
to friends of theirs. Gloria Stefan, uh, Fetter, I think uh, one of the, uh, Michael Schumacher's house was on the, the one on the right. And going there was absolutely ridiculous. It was like going to somewhere like Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, mix, mixture of like watching the Egyptian pyramids get built. And one of the things I realized was, well, they, they said that we want to win the window spec on this last little front. So we analyzed all the houses that had been built to that date, and most houses had 50 tons of cooling on them. Average square footage, 6,000, 7,000 square feet. And failing at cooling. Because it's not only hot there, it's really humid. So I was told I had to go sell these windows, the spec. So I analyzed what's going on. They can't produce enough energy in Dubai without creating rolling brownouts. So kilowatt savings is pretty good. So if 112 villas had green windows over 25 year operational life, they'd save this many kilowatt hours, this many dollars, and this much CO2. The three game players I was trying to show the score to were the people were trying to figure out how to build power plants between Abu Dhabi and Dubai at a rate that was unsustainable. How much money does the royal family keep putting in to keep energy inflation at bay? Because the natural energy inflation in Dubai would be about 60% since every new customer is another new power plant. And then CO2 tonnage, they wanted to be carbon neutral, which was absolutely laughable as a plane lands into that place in the middle of the desert. You're like, oh, that's a, that's a real good one. So when I presented this data at 7 o'clock in the morning, one of the people said, you guys have the order, the largest order of this window company's entire 120-year history. So we went out for an absolutely fabulous $700 cognac dinner at the Burj Al Arab. Because the next day we had to go and present, well, what if you buy all the windows from us? And the Heel was the largest waterfront developer at the world, in the world. They were building 317 miles of artificial coastline. So we said, if you did all the villas with just green windows, one ingredient, one green weapon deployed, and if you're playing in Angry Birds, imagine instead of a little bird, you're just sending in green windows, right? House goes green. Look at the impact. And I pretended it was a game, because when I got back, I'd sold my two software companies and decided, my wife told me, you know, happy wife, happy life, and I'm tired of you traveling, leaving me in Atlanta. I want to move closer to my folks, which they live in Cape Coral. Well, Cape Coral has 400 miles of canals, the most in the entire world, foreclosure capital of the world, but I got to buy during the foreclosure capital of the world, so I got a really, really good deal on an old house that was built by the two brothers that kind of negotiated with the Department of Environmental Protection in Florida in 1957 to dig all these 400 miles of canals, all that lead out to the Gulf of Mexico. So I decided to play a game, but for my own family. So I played the game of, here are all the things like these green windows that I deployed and shot into my renovation house. So everything to the left of the garage was the existing house, and I built a guest house, uh, I mean a guest room and then my office up above because I couldn't find any lead certified office space so I just figured seven steps up a, a flight would be a better commute than driving all the way into Fort Myers. And I played the game that said I wanted to save half the amount of energy of every other house in the neighborhood and half the water. And when I played the game I actually did something that was important to my wife which is save operational capital in my family. And when I converted that into a game board I basically said everything was an investment similar to the Ferrari, although maybe slightly a little more environmentally friendly. But better than the Ferrari, I don't think the Ferrari could actually appreciate as fast as I bet that energy and water would appreciate in my house. So the only, the only thing here that, that, that creates this logarithmic path is I think energy is going to go up about 5% and water is going to go up about 5%. So when you start looking at these kind of solutions, every time I deploy a new solution, my game score changes. And getting better windows actually allows me to get a smaller HVAC system, which allows me to extend the life of that HVAC system, which allows me to put more money in my pocket. So everyone on the street that watched my house go up thought I was some kind of an eco-commie, green, blah, blah, blah. They didn't care. Why is this house built out of styrofoam blocks? Why do you have a metal roof? What are these cisterns in your backyard? All these, like, really silly questions. But I said, well, if you save $30,000 when you built your house, well, you're going to spend about an extra $425,000 over the life of its 30-year mortgage. If I invest 30 k my wife gets $425,000 more in operational capital to run our family. Now, I know we've talked about money not being a very good motivator to do sustainability, but if you can harness economic value to environmental performance, there's not one person on this planet Earth that will argue with you then. Because they'd have to say, 
I'll save 30 to overspend 425. And at the time, you know, the economy's bad. I was a consultant in, in technology. I was a consultant to construction technology, which hasn't been a good time for a lot of us. This made sense to me because I said, what if I don't get the job I want? This is actually money I don't have to go out and find a way to earn, which if you travel for a living and you're a consultant, you realize you can only sell your brain for so many hours of the day. So the conclusion I have is I think data is really complex, and I think it's actually suppressing the growth of our movement. We have to take the data that we have, but massively simplify it so normal folks that are decision makers in almost every category, we're never talking to another engineer who happens to love sustainability like we do. I never get that. I get a normal person that probably couldn't care less because they got to get the money in the door for their corporation. So if we can simplify the data stream, find sustainable decision making being fun. Make games out of it. In Minecraft, there's windmills. In Minecraft, there's solar panels. If we can kind of take these little tiny engineering analyses pieces, put them into a game setting, kids will do that. And one of the things we built was a plug-in for Eco Scorecard into SketchUp. When I go talk around schools, they always say, well, what do you do, mister? I said, well, I build software for the architecture, engineering, and construction industries. <laughs> One time I talked to my, my daughter when she was, in tenth, uh, she was in third grade. Go to the class, I show them the plug-in. They're like, oh, that's pretty cool. The next day I got a call from the teacher that runs the computer lab. She said, Mr. Shariari, can you come and install your, your game on all the machines? I said, what game? She said, well, you did a talk to these, these girls, and they said they wanted to play the game, so they all downloaded but we don't know what to do next. So I went in, taught them how to go on, download SketchUp, go to the 3D warehouse of all of our green objects, and as you deploy these green objects into a building that we have a sample project for, you can do a lead analysis of every ingredient in the building piece by piece out of the BIM models. And the girls the next day when I'm sitting there, they're like playing it, playing it. And at the end, I said, well, did you guys have fun? I'm just going along with my daughter. She's like, tell them you're a game maker. Game makers are cool. You know, my dad's cool. And then we had a sleepover that weekend, and all these little Girl Scouts come up to my office, which they're having a little sleepover upstairs in the guest room, pinatas and all this fun stuff, and they said, Mr. Shariari, your game is broken. Because at the beginning of our plug-in, we have a pie chart that, gets, that counts all the BIM objects and says how many BIM objects, and he had green data with them, how many didn't, so it's a pie chart. They said, we've dumped every single product that you have on this 3D warehouse thing, and you can't get a full green circle, so that means the game's broken. They want to win. They want to figure this stuff out. And I think if I build games that my daughter and her Girl Scout troop would like, I think architects would like to use them too. I think engineers would like to use them because we have to then sell our solutions to our clients. So I think solving this related, you know, sustainability related problem is if we can actually grow the skill sets and the opportunities through STEM type of research, we can actually make engineering decisions smaller and more easily absorbable, and then people won't unlearn that. Everyone on my street now comes over to a dinner party and I find them inspecting things in my house because I have a website of everything I did in my house and all these consultants hate me because I just gave away what we used to do, which is consult to green home design. And all these neighbors have slowly but surely realized I'm not some green dork. I save money and they all show up at my wife's you know, kitchen countertop and say, how do you save $350 a month on running this house? And she just takes them on a tour of, and they're like, well, this house doesn't look really weird on the inside. They all assume that there's some weird, you know, algae-filled tubes that fornicate, creating biomethane, and they go to some digester, we compost some sludge and turn it into tofu. And all of them, like, they, they drink regular beer, they're nice people. You know, my wife has this joke, she says, you know what's green? The bottom of a mojito. She's Cuban, and that, to her, that's what green is. So thank you for your time, and I'll take any questions. Surely there are some questions for Paul. Yeah. Where did that come from? I was curious, uh, you, you mentioned uh, 1,500 people collaborating. Do you know what the largest online game is? You know, how, many, how many people can you actually get to share a, uh, maybe it's Facebook, I'm not sure, but share uh, there oh, it's individual. Wor motivations. World of Warcraft is the largest multiplayer online game, and there's more put on the World of Warcraft wiki than that is on all of Wikipedia. 243 million years has been already spent in, in continuous time playing World of Warcraft, which is absolutely amazing. Dr. Jane McGonigal, who spoke at the closing keynote of Greenbuild, turned me on to all this fascinating research, and she, she's trying to get all these gamers to solve 
the world's most complex problems because gamers exhibit four behaviors, and I don't know exactly what, they, what she says they are, but it's, they have unbelievable optimism, they play games without any structure, without any end game, and they constantly keep trying. And I watch my daughters play games, and we is really amazing because I have, you know, grandparents that come over and they'll play video games with our daughters, and I've never seen my dad want to bowl, do archery or any of these river rafting games, but he plays with the kids and it, it just engages people because people have been playing games for millions of years. So I think game, gamification is really important, not with silly medals, but sustainability things. I'm curious about your comments on SimCity. It sounds like the conclusion is that it, because it was mature, sophisticated urban designers that they weren't able to design a sustainable city. Are you aware of any kids that have been doing any efforts like that? SimCity 6 just came out, so I don't think Fast Company has been tracking how normal kids, but my daughters have already put that on their birthday wish list, so I'm going to get them that and see how that differs because there's a lot of, the problem with SimCity and a lot of these games is there's algorithms that say if you do this and you cut resources, you grow your population, then you can economically serve those populations by selling them more stuff to make more things. So a lot of people have talked about this, this massive consumption methodology that supposedly is going to get us out of this problem. So when I sat on a panel with some folks from Dwell, they said, you know, what do you think? And I said, well, you know, I, I love your magazine, but I think we're not going to buy our way through sustainability by just buying more sustainable bamboo t-shirts. Like, if you can hold on to the T-shirt from ACDC concert in 1984, just hold on to that shirt a little longer, you don't need to buy the bamboo vintage version of that that will probably destroy itself in the wash. So it's, it's hard, you know? It's a hard problem. Other, other questions? Bob. You, uh, you, you talked about the use of games um, uh, with an emphasis on an education and the consciousness raising. Mm -hmm. Uh, power of them, but um, I, I was wondering if you'd be willing to comment on uh, the extent to which game-like uh, approaches and interfaces could serve uh, to democratize the design and the decision support. These girls are, uh, a, as a game, trying to uh, optimize the design of, of a building. Yeah. Aren't they designing the building? Well, I think that there's two things. I, I do think that with things like SketchUp and, and Revit and other products, we can figure out a way for them to actually build the structure. The first thing I wanted to do is show them that there's structures out there, and if you replace bits and pieces of that structure, whether it's the toilets from Toto or better flooring for M interface or better roofing system that's more reflective, every time there's a cause and effect, and we go through iterations or we go through options, like resilience is a lot about options, what, what's amazing is it shows them the power of STEM. And then they ask me, well, why did, why did nothing happen when you did this? Or if you just put in a high efficiency HVAC system, but you didn't do a good thermal envelope, I can only do so much with a better air conditioner. That's why when kids go to our house and they see styrofoam blocks, they're like, why do you do that? I mean, even, even adults, builders have asked me, well, why did you put your stuff in a styrofoam thing filled with concrete? I said, stronger, A. B, do you take your beer to the beach in a concrete cooler? Why wouldn't you do that? Well, I, I sell 21 year air conditioner systems. Well, that'd be like saying you have the crappiest cooler to hold your beer, but you have the world's most efficient ice maker to keep adding ice to the, to the cooler. And when you actually give it to them in that kind of cause and effect, but keep it light to where you're not talking down to them because you're the sustainability dark and you know, they don't know, they start to get the whole, I get it. And I think with kids, what's amazing is they don't have any of the bad constructs we all have as engineers or people that have gone through a formal education that just forces you in this, this is the linear equation. I think one of my goals in the next, you know, before I turn 40 next February is I want to deploy a game so that every kid in America can actually fix everything that's wrong with their existing school using existing technology without needing a lead consultant, lead for homes, lead for schools, or any other people. And they can go to the PTA and just say, if we do these 12 things, we'll save this much money and that'll pay for every kid's educational iPad. Like, that would be my dream in life, to, to, to embed STEM as a game, and then if they get interested, you, you help them become the next game builders that have better algorithms, more predictive analysis, and they can collaborate, because the Girl Scouts actually all got around one computer, which was weird. My daughter was driving, and they were all talking about decisions. SketchUp doesn't work where all the kids could log in at once. That would be another cool thing, is like they could all play on one platform, which I love about Minecraft. They all play on one, one game board. That's pretty cool. Thank you. I'd like to thank you. 
About 15 years ago, <clears throat> I was president of uh, Computer Graphics Pioneers, and I wrote an editorial that basically said, was our legacy going to be violent games or a tool for education? Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Um, that was a great presentation, by the way. Um, so clearly, th there's an opportunity with kids to create this gaming environment that they're compelled to play and learn and, and get excited about this. So what about us adults? Do you think there's an opportunity there to create something, maybe not the same type of environment necessarily, but something to compel us to, to, to learn about this and, and, and kind of draw us in? Or is it really yeah. the kids are the place to focus? No, no. I mean, the, the game that my daughters play is actually the plug-in for SketchUp. They don't know how to use Revit. I don't even know how to use Revit. But um, you know, it's a plugin that just counts the ingredients, evaluates the ingredients right now through LEED or other you know, 28 rating systems. But I think, to me, it would actually be fun to develop plugins, or I'll just call them games, for you know, SolidWorks or for, and call them games. I mean, adults, adults play more games than kids do now. Look at all your phones. You all have something you play, words with friends, something, because you want to play, and you want to play collaboratively. So I think all of you that build you know, some of the world's most advanced engineering platforms, don't be shy about calling it a game. Maybe to your investors you can't use those words, but I, I guarantee you the people that buy your software would much rather plunk down $15,000 for a really good interactive game that helps them sell the engineering solutions to their owner. Because the owner, I mean, I was shocked that I got to go have a dinner that I got to have, but it's all because this information actually ended up at the person that ran Dubai, because he was building literally another whole country on the waterfront. And without doing this, plus 35 other things to make all those houses and dwelling units better, he was actually going to run out of space to build power plants. Not the capital to build them, he was going to run out of space. Because all the smelting of aluminum for all those skyscrapers, all the desalination plants, that no man's land between Abu Dhabi and Dubai is literally the most horrific scene you've ever seen. It was going to run out of room. So it wasn't the capital resource. They were physically run out of the finite, non-renewable resources. So this is a game. And, you know, if you want to change your output, it's just like, you know, the heads-up display on all these fighter jets. Every pilot gets his own customized helmet, so he sees what he needs to see. So this could be other metrics. A lot of you guys have talked about the other metrics that drive larger decision-making. This is just what drives the people that have to be conserved instead to take out their wallet and spend. So I'd love to build games for you guys' and stuff. Jack has a question. <clears throat> These metrics, uh, earlier speakers have talked about measures of effectiveness. Uh, as you watch the kids play the games, do they begin to zero in on what things are really important to them? Yeah. Yeah, like my, my daughter, when we finished doing the cisterns, we're the only people in our entire town that have cisterns, but they're illegal, so I don't tell people in Cape Coral that I have cisterns. I just call them big the pads for the kids to roller skate on. Bella wrote on the cistern, she wrote in paint, Bella's cistern, because there's a 3,000-gallon one for Bella and a 3,000-gallon one for Sevilla. And they watch rain hit our roof, and they, like, during a rainstorm, they go and they pick it up and go, we're full. And the reason why is we get 16 times more water delivered to every house and dwelling unit in all of Southwest Florida than we need in a year. The sad thing is we just spent as a city $100 million on a water treatment plant. If we would have just had cisterns, which, you know, some civil engineers argue with me, like, it might not work. I'm like, rainfall's not going to work, gravity's not going to work, or the large bucket technology is not going to work. <laughs> city engineers argue with me, this might not work. I, I'm, I'm dumbfounded. I've had 13 Girl Scout troops go, well, how do we make cisterns? So I have a friend that works for a water resource at a Coca-Cola company, and they have all these concentrate jugs. They give them away. So all these kids have asked to get all these concentrate jugs from orange juice, and they can build their own little 50-gallon cistern and capture and wash their bikes or wash their cars or whatever. I mean, you need a big one to, to satisfy your whole house's need, but to them there's no blockage. And that's why game playing to me, to them, will forever make them want to be STEM-minded, they don't all have to be engineers. They need to be poets and literary critics and writers. You just can't lose that, that knowledge. Thank you. I suggest that you're going well beyond STEM to a thing called system. <laughs> you're teaching them. They're, they're seeing what system really means. Yeah. 
and a Professor Cabrera up at uh, Cornell has built a little set of games, physical games, and a book called Thinking at Every Desk. And I think you'd really enjoy getting together with Yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to do it. Because they're on the same dream. Question from Brian. Can you uh, share the, the website of your home, home website? Yeah, it's just flgreenhouse.com. And every month for, I guess, another year and a half, we'll put up our energy and water you know, bill. And you know, that was the only way to actually prove to my community that I wasn't some whack job. So I said, you know, and some of it doesn't work. Let me tell you, there's, there's things on my house that don't work, and it's fine, and it's all right. You learn. That's how we learn. Thank you. Let's give him a big hand.